Hello and welcome to the overview of chapter 48 of Guyton and Hall's medical physiology textbook. In this chapter we'll be going over the somatic sensations which is all about sensory information and how the sensory information is transmitted from the receptor to the brain to be processed. If you enjoyed the video please don't forget to give it a like and subscribe to the channel and if you would like to support the channel then visit the Patreon link within the description where you can get access to downloadable audio files. So it starts off by really describing what a somatic sense is and that's just the sensory information from around the body. And we have three types of somatic senses, our mechanoreceptive somatic senses, which include tactile and position sensations. So you know, touch and feel, and also where your body is relative to space. And then we have thermoreceptive senses, so temperature. And then our third one is our pain sense or nociception. There are other classifications of somatic sensations, including exteroreceptive sensations, meaning the outside of the body, proprioceptive sensations, meaning the physical location of your body, visceral sensations being the viscera, so if your internal organs have a sensation, and then deep sensations, so your deep tissues, so your fascia, your muscles, your bone. There are other classification systems um, is essentially the point there. So the main thing here is that the mechanoreceptors uh, or touch pressure vibration, they're all technically the same type of receptor, but they do get separated in terms of the classification of the sensation. So touch being receptors in the skin and tissues, pressure sensation being the sensation found in deeper tissues, and then vibration obviously being a repetitive sensory signal, so a vibration. Now when it comes to our tactile receptors, there are six different types of tactile receptors. I'll just kind of list them off here and you can kind of go into more details if need be. So we've got the free nerve endings which are kind of everywhere in our skin and many tissues. We've got the Messner's receptor which is the non-hairy parts of the skin, so fingertips, lips, those areas. Um, also in your fingertips and those kinds of areas we also have these expanded tip tactile receptors which can also be grouped as this Merkel's disc which is shown in the, the figure over here and they can all be grouped together into an egodome receptor. The fourth one is called a hair end organ which is basically just that nerve right at the base of a hair so every time your hair moves it feels that movement of the hair so you're able to notice if something's about to touch your skin. The fifth one is a rough and ease endings which is just your deeper internal organs and then the sixth one which we've talked about before is our Pacinian receptors those kind of ball-like ones that we talked about in the previous chapter. Now something that will come up more frequently throughout this is that we kind of have these two types of sensations or somatic senses. We've got this very precise one which is uh, able to be localized very easily and has a very rapid signal and then we have this more cruder one which is poorly localized meaning that you can't tell exactly where that sensation is coming from and then there's also a slower transmission of a nerve and we'll see exactly where those are going to and why that is the case in this chapter. It has a brief talk about tickling and why we actually have an itch receptor or an itch sensation and that's just more for being able to reflexively itch that spot so then you can get rid of some external uh, insect or something along those lines. Now when it comes to the actual transmission of these sensory signals we have these two main systems for transmitting it through the spinal nerve. So we've got the dorsal column medial lumniscal system and then the anterior lateral system. The real bulk thing here is that the dorsal column medial lumniscal system sends it straight to the brain, sends the fast signals and they're the ones going to really localize where that signal is coming from. So uh, a very good at localization of that sensation, uh, very fast track straight to the brain and is well localized. The anterior lateral system is more poorly localized, more for our pressure or more for our kind of pain and thermo 
receptors. So temperature, pain, those more dull types of sensations, which don't necessarily need to be highly localized. They travel a little slower through this anterior lateral system. Uh, and once again, they're poorly localized. So we'll get into more details exactly where they come from. There's a figure here which shows you what happens to those sensory nerves to go into the dorsocolum medial lumniscal system. So you can see that it branches immediately into the medial and lateral sides and then they will eventually synapse to go forward through the spinal nerve. Now, without having to go into too much detail about the cross-section of the spinal nerve, we have the white matter on the outside, gray matter in the inside, Gray matter is typically where all of the synapses are. That's where all the actual cell bodies are, so that's why it's gray. White matter is typically more made up of the axons, so that's where all the myelin is, which is fat, so that's why it's white. And so we do have these regions within what's called the dorsal horn and the ventral horn, which is almost like where all the nerves come in and attach at a certain point. It's kind of a grouping area to then go to another region. And then we have our tracks on the outside in the white matter. So we've got our tract of lassure over here, spinocervical tract, dorsal spinocerebellar tract, ventral spinocerebellar tract. And these tracks are kind of all over. So we have our anterior lateral spinothalamic pathway over here as well. Um, so as you could imagine, a sensory nerve is going to come in, it's going to make its sort of connection in whichever portion it needs to, and then it's going to send out that axon into the tract where it needs to go to get to the brain. So it's almost like a sorting area, like a postal service. They come in, go to a certain area, and then they get sent out again to go through the spinal nerve. And then these figures here that are throughout this chapter really show that at each point of the spinal column, so or the spinal cord. So you can see it down here, we're down more the lumbar sacral region as we go up, getting more thoracic, and then we start to get into more the brain stem region as we go up all the way into the cerebral cortex. So this kind of diagram is just showing us that the sensory nerve comes in and then it will go into the tract that will eventually synapse at a certain dorsal horn. And then for the dorsal column medial and nephiscal pathway, it will then cross over to then go up through that tract all the way until we get to the thalamus. And then we'll be then sorted to go to certain regions in the cortex and the cerebral cortex, which we'll also get to. So this just shows us the entire pathway. Obviously, go into however much detail you need to for your particular reason for studying, but you can get into um, the very nitty gritty of exactly where all these positions are, all these pathways, which is probably going to be too much for this textbook. So, the basics of the dorsal column medial lumniscal pathway is that you have that medial branch that actually just goes straight up towards the brain. And then we have this lateral branch, which actually has a synapse within the dorsal horn of the gray matter um, to then send off kind of three different other pathways. The main one is going up to the brain once again. Um, the second one is to just do a local spinal cord reflex. So basically just send a motor neuron back to whichever muscle is associated with that sensation. And then the other one is to give rise to the spinocerebellar tracts, which we'll cover in later chapters. Basically going to the cerebellum, which is more related to our motor function. Now, a big distinguishing feature for the dorsal column medial lumniscal pathway compared to that other pathway, that anterior lateral pathway, is that it has very good spatial orientation, meaning that the nerve that comes from the tail of the body will then be separated from the top of the body by the rest of the body, essentially, meaning that as a nerve comes in, it gets slotted into one area and the next nerve will just go on top, on top, on top, and then you end up with a layering system which is where all the nerves have come from. So there's a spatial orientation. So all the lower parts of the body are in the center of the cord because they have entered in first, and then everything at the top of the body is more on the outside of the cord because it came in last and just sandwiched on top. And this is all really going to the somatosensory cortex, which is highlighted here in the blue. And it is the posterior portion of the central fissure. So we have this major central fissure right here, and just posterior to that or behind that is our somatosensory area. We do have kind of two areas, but um, our somatosensory area is all to do with 
knowing where a certain sensation has come from. Somatosensory area one, as it goes into, um, is much more localized. So it is able to really differentiate which areas that that sensation has come from, and it is much more important. So whenever you hear somatosensory cortex, it's usually relating to somatosensory area one, whereas somatosensory area two is very poorly localized. So you can see the difference here, leg, arm, face versus thigh, thorax, neck, shoulder, hand, fingers, tongue, intra-abdominal. So it's just much more of a cruder system. And so if we actually look at that somatosensory area one, we get this funky looking diagram here, which is just a slice through that somatosensory area. And you can see that at each portion, you can tell where that signal has come from. So we've got the pharynx, tongue, teeth, and then we've got the lower lip, lips, upper lip, face, nose, eye, and then we have the arm, thorax and then the leg so it's all kind of coming down here and each relative size determines how much sensory receptors are in that region so since the lips are relatively huge compared to the rest of the body we have a lot of sensory receptors in our lips the same with our fingers as well obviously because we're quite tactile so there's a lot of sensation in our fingers versus our forearm which is relatively you know that's larger than our lips and our fingers but the forearm there is a smaller amount of sensation in that region it then actually talks about these columns so this is a histological view of each portion. So one column will correlate to one particular area. So say the arm or you know one particular sensation or one particular sensory area. So that actually starts off with all incoming sensory signals coming into this row here. So row four, um, layers one and two have more non-specific input and they're more just trying to control how much of this column is going to be excitable. So it's more of a regulatory role. The layers two and three, um, they have axons that actually cross over to the other side of the brain through the corpus callosum. And then neurons five and six, they send axons to the deeper parts of the nervous system. And then each of these columns actually have a connection anteriorly or just in front of it to the motor cortex. So obviously if we have a certain sensation and we wanna correspond that with a muscle movement, we need that column to be able to respond and send the signal to our motor cortex. So they know the functions from those metasensory areas because of looking at people who have had excision or removal of those areas in both sides of the brain. So people with excision of this particular area, they are unable to localize sensations around different parts of the body. They can do it pretty crudely, say it's maybe left hand, but they wouldn't be able to say that it's in, you know, on the top or something like that. Um, they're also unable to judge degrees of pressure against the body. So if someone's pressing very hard versus very lightly, they will be unable to judge the weight of objects. So they may think something is light when it's heavy and vice versa. Um, they will be unable to judge the shapes or forms of objects and that's called osteronosis. And then they'll also be unable to judge the texture of materials. So as you can imagine, if you're unable to actually feel an object very well, you can't really tell the texture. But you still have the ability to feel pain and temperature as well. Uh, so obviously that's not lost, meaning that it must be going in another pathway, such as the anterior lateral pathway, or at least not terminating at the somatosensory area so they must use something like the thalamus and we will get to that. So there's this area called the somatosensory association area which is just immediately posterior to the somatosensory area one and that's really for trying to get all the information from that somatosensory area, process it and then just provide more information. So the and really decipher the meaning of that information. So for instance someone who has that area stimulated, they feel like there's a feeling of an object or a, but they can't exactly tell what it is. So clearly it's trying to help the brain decipher what an object is or what the sensation is. And if you actually remove that portion of the brain, then the person can't actually recognize complex objects that would be involved with trying to process that information and figure out what's going on. But not only that, then they, if you only remove that one side, so say just the left side, then the opposite side of the body, since as we mentioned back 
at the tract, how it kind of crossovers in this portion. So the sensory sensation from the left is processed in the right side of the brain. So because of that, if you remove that right area, that somatosensory area, then people can actually completely forget what the contralateral side is doing. So let's say the left side's removed, they may be feeling an object and they'll be able to describe what it feels like with the left hand, but not the right hand. So here it's, this is talking about what ex actually happens with this pathway. And you can see that it's a divergence system. So divergence occurs where one signal spreads into many. And in order for a strong sim stimulus, you need all of the neurons to be stimulated. But the neurons in the middle have a faster discharge. So the central ones are faster, but if only the central ones are stimulated, then there'll be a weak stimulus. Now a way to actually tell how certain areas are able to localize very well is this two point discrimination. Mainly meaning that if you have two kind of points and you press them very close to one another, are you able to tell whether there's two points or just one point? And for instance, the hand, you're able to tell the two points that are only one to two millimeters apart versus on your back, they have to be more 30 to 70 millimeters apart in order for you to be able to recognize that there's actually two points there. And the reason behind that is one, there's more sensory receptors on your hand, but two, we also have this lateral inhibition. So lateral inhibition is, as we had already briefly talked about, the concept that once a stimulus is being passed through a certain pathway, it's also going to inhibit pathways along the way to prevent its, that transmission of that one signal spiraling out and causing a impulse through every single other neuron. So that lateral inhibition is going to help to really specify where that sensation is coming from. And figure 4810 depicts that very well, where the blue line is without lateral inhibition, but the red lines is with lateral inhibition. And you can see you could definitely tell that there's two little stimuli here versus the blue line. You'll just say that there's one stimuli. And then lastly here, remember the dorsal column is mainly for our rapidly changing conditions. So kind of vibrations and uh, things that need quick responses or quick uh, nerve impulses. And it is very localized and also has a range of intensity too. As we've talked about in the previous chapters, you're able to tell whether something's a weak or a strong stimulus. Now it's important to recognize those facts before we go into our anterior lateral pathway, but briefly before that, we have the position sensors. So, so this is our proprioception, and we have two types of position sensors. Static position sense, so that's just where your body is right now without moving, and then the rate of movement sense, also known as kinesthesia or dynamic proprioception. So that's if your joints are moving and where your body is, so then you're not going to trip and fall or you know lean too far to one side. And the way bo the body does this is knowing where the joints are and what the joint angulation is, so then you're able to tell exactly where everything is. So we have various receptors for that, including the muscle spindles, but then also our Pacinian receptors, raffinis endings, and then Golgi tendons as well. So there are more in our deep tissues telling us where the tendons are and how much tension is on them to help with that joint angulation. Now the anterior lateral pathway, remember we had briefly talked about this before, how this is much more poorly localized and there's a slower transmission as well. This is the pathway 4813 and you can see that it crosses over instantly. So it goes straight into the dorsal horn, crosses over and then travels in the anterior lateral pathways which includes the anterior spinothalamic and the lateral spinothalamic tracts, meaning spine to thalamus, basically. So it ends up in the thalamus and goes on from there. So they are more for the signals that don't need to be highly localized. So temperature, pain, crude touch, itch, tickle, those kind of uh, sensations. We just need to know it's there and it's present. And the ability to actually tell the intensity is also lower as well. So those are our three main differences, is that it's slower, the spatial localization is poor, and then also the intensities are less accurate. We just need to know it's there, basically. And then this last portion here is just some little tidbits of information. So mainly saying that the thalamus, you know, has the ability or a slight ability to discriminate tactile sensation, but then also is involved with our pain and temperature sensations as well. 
our cortical fugal signals, uh, the signal that actually goes from the cerebral cortex down to the thalamus and the brainstem to then control the intensity of signal coming from them. So once again, that negative feedback loop to kind of slow down that signal to say, yeah, I know what's going on. We don't need to keep sending me those signals if need be. And then lastly here is the dermatome. So that's what this funky figure is looking at. And what that's saying is that each spinal nerve, so each nerve that comes out of the spinal column, is innervating one specific portion of the skin, or dermatome. So each color or each shade of color is a particular dermatome. The red is just coming from the thoracic spinal column versus the blue, which is coming from the cervical spinal column. And then we have the lumbar and then the sacral as well. So you're able to localize where a spinal cord lesion is by telling exactly where our dysfunction starts. So that's the end of the chapter. Hope you enjoyed it. Feel free to leave a comment. Otherwise, we'll see you in the next video.